So for analysis, I'm joined now by Robert Spitzer. He's a professor of Emiratus of political science at SUNY Cortland. He's also the author of six books on gun policy, including The Politics of Gun Control. Really appreciate having you on the program once again. Now, firstly, some of the recent cases we've been hearing about in the media of unarmed people being shot and killed in the US have renewed a discussion of so-called stand your gun ground laws. Can you, what can you tell us about these specific laws and which states have them? Today, more than half the states have enacted a, kind of a new generation of stand your ground laws. The idea of a stand your ground law, that is to say, a law that says if you are in a public place, not your home, and you are confronted with a threat or immediate uh, uh, threat of violence to yourself, you have a right to resist that person instead of leaving the area if you could do so safely. And that's an idea that traces back to the 19th century uh, in American law in some states. But in the mid-2000s, in about 2005, the state of Florida enacted a strengthened stand your ground law that not only said you had the right to stay where you were if you were in a public place to defend yourself, even to use lethal force against some person that you say was a threat, but all you had to do to demonstrate your claim was to say, I felt that my life was in danger or that I was in danger at least of grievous bodily harm. And the legal uh, presumption changed in that Florida law. And since then, more than half the states have adopted laws of this kind. And it's also happened at a time where more Americans are owning and carrying guns than ever. And the predictable result is more conflict out on the streets. So if people can essentially say, I feared for my life, and not face charges, what kind of impact is that having on the rate of homicides in these states? Well, I, it, several studies have shown that states that have adopted these laws have witnessed an increase in the homicide rate uh, between 8 and 11 percent. Now, if a person makes that claim, it is still possible for local law enforcement and investigators and prosecutors to examine the case but under the laws of many of these states, their ability to do that is severely hampered, precisely because the law in many of these states, like the Florida law, shifts the burden onto the state to demonstrate that the person did not act in their own behalf for their own self-defense, when the person who engages in this act uh, simply has to say, I felt that I was in danger for my life without having to provide any actual objective proof or evidence. Now, research shows that laws increase, these laws increase racial disparities in the US criminal justice system. Can you explain for us the variety in which ways this law does that? Yes, uh, there are studies that examine how this, these laws are administered with respect to race. And what they discover is that in cases where white people uh, let's say kill a, a white person kills a black person and the white person claims a stand your ground defense, they are much more likely to have that defense accepted through the legal system than the reverse. That is, if it's a black person killing a white person and the black person claims a stand your ground defense, it is statistically far less likely that the claim will be accepted by, uh, by the government uh, under similar circumstances. So there is statistical, uh, quite a stark disparity, even when the facts of these cases are pretty similar. Mm. Now, it seems at this point, I mean, we've had so many discussions of this nature here with you on this channel, and it seems that we are unable, or, you know, the society, rulers at large, are unable to scale down the violence and death by limiting access to guns. There will always be guns. So how do we change the belief that it's a good idea to shoot for first and ask questions later. What does it take to rewire this mindset? Uh, that's a, a very complicated but important question. And I think there are at least two things. The first is that part of the mindset in America right now is one of trying to stoke fear in the hearts of Americans by conservative Republicans in particular who want to argue that America has become less safe uh, with a Democratic president in the White House and Democrats controlling Congress and many of the states. 
objectively, that's not true. Objectively, America is safer than it has been uh, in the last 30 years or so, though there has been a rise, small rise in the homicides in the last few years because of the pandemic. But the other thing is the guns themselves. Simply because the impulse to grab a gun if you own one and to pull the trigger can, it, it takes place in a very rapid way, and it invites misjudgment. Many of the people who commit these uh, crimes or these killings are people who seem to be well-intentioned, who seem to be ordinary citizens, but they miscalculate, they misread the situation, and the gun makes it very, very easy to uh, cause a catastrophic mistake. And another, and even though guns cannot be eliminated from society, there is much that can be done that can improve training, safety measures, storage measures, uh, and other kinds of things that could at least reduce or minimize some of these tragic outcomes. All right, Robert, really appreciate your insight. Once again, Robert Spitzer there for...